Good evening. Welcome to the Bradford County Historical Society. My name is Matt Carl, if you forgot, since it's been a long time. <laughs> Little did we know in October of 2019, when we had our last program, what would happen between now and then, but here we are back at it again. So I have lots of announcements about what we're doing this year before we begin. Uh, first of all, last year, we had Friday Night at the Museum online. Did anyone watch the videos on the internet? Raise your hand. You all win a new car, so they'll be waiting in the parking lot. <laughs> we tried our best to keep up with modern technology, and so that led us into this year talking about live streaming. So the Historical Society has made a pretty significant investment in making a lot of changes around here to do live streaming. Tonight we're not live, but we have video cameras in the back. I'm testing to get, get things in order. We've had to change our internet phone service provider, change our security, our fire system, everything, just to make live streaming happen. So it will, it will soon be upon us. Um, museum hours this year are Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 10 to 2. Jonathan out here that signed you in is our summer tour guide this year. He's a college student working with us. And uh, so feel free to come back. We have an exhibit upstairs, several other changes, but the main one is the anniversary exhibit on the second floor, right up in the second floor corner. And it's about the 150th anniversary of the Bradford County Historical Society. And there are 24 panels that tell the whole story from 1870 to the present, as well as display cases full of things. And uh, it's really interesting to see how history preservation has evolved over 150 years in Bradford County. So check that out. You can check it out afterwards tonight or come back at, at, uh, during museum hours. Also, the research library is back to regular hours, which are Wednesday through Friday, 10 to 4, and the first Saturday of the month, 10 to 2, just like we had done before in the olden days. So Denise is anxious to have you come back and do some research again. It's starting to pick up again with visitors, so uh, we're pleased with that. Um, Friday night at the museum this year, the schedule card was on your seat. Feel free to take that with you. This year we decided to start out a little bit late. We don't have any refreshments this year, but hopefully you'll come for the program anyway and then go home and eat some cookies afterwards. But um, Four programs starting this, this month and uh, on the third Friday of the month, and so feel free to come out for those. Um, and also become a member of the Bradford County Historical Society if you're not one. We appreciate your support. Um, this month's program has brought out many people, many family members, and is about the Pilot family. We did this program back sometime before COVID, I think it was, at the Dandy uh, over in Wysox. And, uh, but Henry Farley has expanded on that quite a bit. Since then, so there should be all sorts of information about the history of the Piolettes. So this evening's program is titled The Piolettes, Pioneer Residents of Bradford County. And I'll turn it right over to Henry. Thank you, Matt. Okay, um, the painting that's on the, the screen right now is in the Tawanda Public Library. And when I started uh, doing the research for the opening of the Dandy Mini Mart, I went into the library and saw that thought, wow. And so then I collected all the articles that we've collected over the years about the Pilot Mansion and the family. And it just shows how much interest that there has been through time uh, for, for that family. This is Joseph Marie Pilot. He was born August 15, 1773 at Bonneville, France, about 15 miles southeast of Geneva, Switzerland. Joseph M. received a thorough education in France and entered the service of Napoleon as a lieutenant of the cavalry and followed the fortunes of the great captain until severely wounded at the Battle of Austerlitz, disabling him for service in the field. He was then appointed postmaster of the Army of the Alps, Retiring from the army, he entered the banking house of the celebrated financier Talleyrand in Paris. While there, Count Leray de Chaumont requested the great banker recommend someone to act as his agent for the sale of his lands in northeastern Pennsylvania. He at once named Joseph M. Pilette, who accepted the position and arrived in Philadelphia in 1806. His age was 33. 
He remained in Philadelphia a year and mastered the English language and then came to Rummerfield near the former French settlement where some of the French refugees of the revolution still resided, probably the Omis and the Laportes. He entered the mercantile business with William Keeler and Wysock and soon made his home there. He made the acquaintance of Miss Elizabeth Whitney, who had come to Wysock from Kingston to teach summer school in the little village. She was the daughter of Elisha and Esther Clark Whitney and was born in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, December 10, 1786. Bradsby, in his history of Bradford County, refers to Elizabeth as a woman of rare accomplishments and intelligence. Joseph M. and Elizabeth Whitney were married September 29, 1811, in Wysock by the Reverend M. Minor York. Elizabeth's family had relocated from Massachusetts to the Wyoming Valley in 1810 and soon after came up to Rome. Historical accounts of Joseph Marie state that he towered over six feet tall and was very rigid in stature. Joseph Marie and Elizabeth Whitney Pilet were the parents of five children, Victor Emile, who lived from 1815 to 1892, Joseph E., who lived from 1819 to 1894, Francis Teresa, who lived from 1815 to 1892, who married Alexander Dewing late in life. And that's just about all we know about her. He was from over in the Larraysville area, and he died, and then she wound up back with her brother Victor. Um, Emily Victorine, who lived from 1817 to 1897, who married Thomas Weirman, and Elizabeth Josephine, who lived from 1823 to 1845, and married uh, Delison C. Salisbury. Elizabeth Josephine Pilette died in 1845, the youngest daughter. The reporter, a local newspaper, stated that she died suddenly at the age of 22 after a short and agonizing illness. In one year and a half, she passed from the bridal robe, a young mother, to her shroud. Diana and Dallinson Salisbury had one daughter, Elizabeth Josephine, who married John de la Montagna. He died and she married second James McQuiston. Elizabeth and John de la Montagna had a daughter, Diana, who married Joseph Vandergrift, a wealthy oil tycoon. She married second Edward T. Young, an attorney. Diana Montagna and Joseph Vandergrift had a son, Jacob J., who in 1930 married Eula Lee Kaiser Hill, the daughter of John F. Kaiser of Tuanda. This was his third marriage and her second, and they lived in Washington, D.C. until Jay's death in 1959, at which time Eula Lee returned to Tuanda to live closer to her Kaiser relatives. Edwin Young moved to Washington, D.C. area, where he was an attorney. He, as a college student, traveled for a year on a college cruise ship that toured the world. Toured the world. In 1926, the first ever student travel experiment was launched. Students from colleges and universities across the country were recruited to participate and travel the world on the cruise ship Rindom. This was seen as an opportunity to combine formal education with travel, and the project became known as the Floating University. The ship carried 50 faculty members and 450 students and was considered important enough to be featured weekly in the New York Times. The cruise lasted from September to May, a full school year. Edward P. Young, Jr. of Tawanda was a student on the cruise, and he sang for the King of Siam on the trip. These are descendants of the family. The descendants of this family still live in the Washington, D.C. area. Joseph Marie Pilot visited France in 1836 and 1837, as is noted in an entry in his son Victor E.'s diary, dated January 3rd, 1837. This day, we received a letter from our father, dated Bonneville, October 31. We were all highly delighted to gain tidings from him. He will not return before spring. These are the Luray lands, and Luray, if you think about it, Luraysville is named after this guy. So this, this is a map of his lands from a survey that was done in 1791 by William Gray. Luraysville would come from this as well as Joseph purchased land in Wysock where he built his home. The home was on the green directly in front of the present pilot building in Wysock. It was a rambling old house with rooms and closets and unexpected places. It had long, low roofs with immense low verandas, small windows and huge chimneys, low ceilings and great fireplaces. It was said by his grandson, Louis, in later years that the home was very comfortable and had been added on to over the years to meet the needs of the family. Note the, map, the area the map covers. It goes from Athens to Lake Wasaking. So that was quite a lot of land that, that Joseph Marie was responsible for. This is a plot map of the Luray lands. 
And this is the Viscount James Luray Duchamel. This is an appointment of Joseph Marie Pilot to postmaster in Luzerne County, January 22nd, 1812. We became Bradford County October 13th, 1812. And that's Joseph Marie Pilot, a black and white photo from the painting. The White Sox Presbyterian Church. The 1936 Historic Building Survey of Pennsylvania states, the church at first was a church without a church, and the congregation members met at houses and sometimes in barns. Later, a wooden, wooden meeting house was erected, a few hundred yards north of the present brick church in Wysock. The congregation in 1828 erected the then Congregational Church. The plans for the building are said to have been drawn by Joseph Marie Pilette. This is a letter that was written to Judge Edward Herrick, May 8, 1822, from Joseph M. Pilate, asking that a stranger to the area by the name of Wilhelm not be allowed to open a public house in Wysock. The letter was penned by Pilate and states Mr. Pilate's strong feeling for his fellow residents and business people. So he was looking out for people, making sure that nobody weaseled in on anybody. This is Victor Emile Pilate. He was born June 28, 1812 and died near the spot where he was born, August 27, 1890. Victor E. was not the fortunate possessor of a book education. His opportunities were limited to such advantages as the primitive schools in the early history of the county afforded. He was the higher, educa he was the higher education gained on the stern realities and experience in a long and practical business life. In early life, he gave evidence of that native ability energy and independence of character that distinguish his life and place him in the front rank with the most brainy and talented men in Pennsylvania. He was fearless and aggressive. His opinions upon all questions of public policy were freely and clearly defined. No man in the Commonwealth possessed a keener or more intelligent and active interest in the welfare and prosperity of the agriculture and producing classes than Victor E. Pilette. One of the best and most successful agriculturalists in Pennsylvania, he was ever their devoted friend and their ablest champion. His voice on behalf of their concern was heard all over the Union, and his ringing speeches and the advocacy of the interests of men who feed the world were echoed from Maine to the Golden Gate. His business life extended over a period of more than half a century and was characterized by that energy and rare ability that are given to few men. But when 25 years of age, he and his brother were contractors for the work on a section of the North Branch Canal, then under construction in the state. His promptness in the execution of the work secured him the favor of state officials and being active and influential in the councils of the Democratic Party and the northern portion of the state. Upon the election of Governor David R. Porter in 1839, he was appointed superintendent of the North Branch Canal, then owned and operated under the control of the state government. Subsequently, he was appointed colonel in the state militia. The duties of these positions he discharged with unwavering fidelity and signal abil single ability. During his incumbency of the office of superintendent of the canal, David Wilmot, author of the celebrated Wilmot Proviso, when that was then a young attorney, just commencing practice in the courts of Bradford County. Colonel Pilot was allowed as superintendent $1,000 per annum for clerk hire and he generously gave the position to Wilmot and performed the greater portion of the duties himself. This is um, some excerpts from the diary of, of uh, Victor Pilate from 1837, and this is just to give you an example of how travel was around here and uh, the cost. On Sunday, April 23rd, 1837, this day I left home for Philadelphia rode my horse down in company of Mr. Clark as far as Rummerfield Creek, and there went aboard the rafts all the way down to Skinner's Eddy, landed for the night in the morning at 2 o'clock. F. Allen, the pilot who took over the courses to Muse, pulled out and, and at about 4, he was on the bar of the foot of the Narrows just at the farm of Overpeck where I left him. April 24th, today I left as above mentioned and got Overpeck to drive me to Tunkhannock to ride the stagecoach, got there in time, Come to Wilkes-Barre about 4 p.m. Saw several of our friends, got a draft on Philadelphia for $15, paid 1%. Paid Nicholson and Banks in full. The 25th. Today we left Wilkes-Barre at 5 a.m., arriving in Nesquahoney at 7 in the, in the p.m. Nothing of interest. Wrote home today. The 26th. 
This day, I reached Philadelphia about 4 o'clock p.m., took lodging at the White Swan on Ray Street, which under its present host, John Horton, is a very respectable house, attentive service, good beds, good table, and very interesting and highly respectable guests. I make them particularly communicative and agreeable. So it took from Sunday to Thursday to get to Philadelphia. In 1846, he was elected to the House at Harrisburg as a Democrat and was re-elected in 1847. Now remember all the Republicans in Bradford County, there wasn't a Republican Party such as we know it today in 1846. So the Democratic Party was kind of like what the Republican Party is today. The war between the United States and Mexico was then in progress, <clears throat> and while a member of the legislature, he was appointed paymaster in the Army with the rank of major by President Polk and assigned to duty with the Army of the Invasion under Generals Taylor and Scott. Prior to his departure for Mexico, June 24, 1847, he was married to Miss Jane Miller, daughter of the Honorable Jesse Miller, the then Secretary of the Commonwealth under Governor Porter. This union was most, a most fortunate one, Miss Miller inheriting many of the admirable characteristics of her gift, gifted and distinguished, distinguished father. Mrs. Pilot died in 1879. In 1855 and 56, in the company with John I. Blair of New Jersey, he constructed 20 miles of railroad in New Jersey. In the same years, he and his brother Joseph E. built the Barclay Railroad from Tawanda to the Barclay Mines, a distance of 16 miles. And that is extremely important because there was no way to get the coal off Barclay Mountain until the Pilot Brothers built that railroad. So that was the start of coal mining on Barclay and the, the whole rise of, of that mountain. The Pilot Brothers helped establish the Schrader Manufacturing and Mining Company. They built a sawmill that produced many thousand feet of sawed lumber per day. The products of this mill were transported to the south, principally in the Wyoming Valley area. This material was in great demand. Hemlock lumber was required in great quantities to build coal breakers and other outbuildings around the mine shafts, as well as being used in the construction of company towns, which grew up around the company mines. A lifelong personal friend of Mr. Buchanan, after his election to the presidency, he offered Pilot the position of private secretary. Being then engaged in business that required his personal attention, he declined. Colonel Pilot was instrumental in the active agent in the purchase of the North Branch Canal for the Lehigh Valley Railroad Company. When accomplished, he was made superintendent of the construction. In 1866, of the railroad extension from Lackawanna Junction to Waverly, New York, the work occupying three years. The first train bearing the president of the Lehigh Valley Railroad, Honorable Aza Packer, its chief officials, and hundreds of citizens along the line passed over the road 152 years ago on September 9, 1869. Victor E. Pilette was appointed postmaster at White Sox in 1838, and this is a certificate that verifies it. When I was preparing this presentation for the opening of the Dandy Mini Mart in the Pilot Mansion, we received a call at the Bradford County Historical Society asking if we had any interest in photos and memorabilia from the Pilot family. I immediately returned the call to Dr. John Funkhauser, MD, a retired surgeon who lives in West Falmouth, Massachusetts. He had no idea that any of the family still lived in the area and he had never been here. He said his four children had no interest in the memorabilia at this time, but would it be available to them should they ever want to see the items? Funkhauser's deceased wife was a descendant of Emily Victorine and Thomas Weirman. In a few days after the call, we received two boxes of items from Dr. Funkhauser's. Talk about strange happenings. I mean, we were working on this, and this call came, and it's just like, you know, somebody guided this guy to, to get these things to us, because there are things that came that, you know, would never have existed otherwise. This is Emily Victorian Pilette, the daughter of Joseph Marie. She's pictured here in her wedding photo taken in 1840. And this proves to us that they were doing daguerreotype photography in Bradford County in 1840 because they were married here, and this is their wedding photo. She married Thomas Weirman, an engineer on the North Branch Canal. Her obituary stated, Thomas T. Weirman, a young engineer employed by the state in constructing the North Branch Canal, met and later, later married Emily Pilette in 1840. Mrs. Weirman's life was closely identified with that of her husband in his long service developing the transportation interests of this state. Both canals and railroads are principally along the Susquehanna and Uniata rivers. 
Their movings were frequent until their permanent residence was taken up in Harrisburg in 1859, when Mr. Weirman became chief engineer and general superintendent of the Pennsylvania Canal Company. This is their wedding announcement. Guess you can read that all right. And this is Emily. And that's a photo of her later in life. And these are all things that came in those boxes from Massachusetts. These are their children. They, they are Thomas, Victor, Sarah, Teresa, and Susan. And both sons became influential men in the railroad industry. And this is the North Branch Canal Dam at Tawanda. Um, it's just a, you know, part of what the pilots worked on. It's, while they managed the canal. And here's David Wilmot, who uh, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in any part of the said territory, lands acquired by the United States for the Mexican War, except for crime whereof the party shall be first duly convicted. And I put this in here since Victor hired him and had to do all the work for him, so he was too busy writing things, I guess. Uh, during the canal and railroad building period, more labor was required to do the work than the population of the area could furnish. In 1829, the census of Bradford County was 11,554. Between 1830 and 1840, the census mounted from 19,746 to 32,769. It numbered in 1850 42,831, and in the following decades arrived at the count of today about 60,000. Charles F. Wells became the agent for the pilots whereby the great migration of the Irish into Bradford County was accomplished. Mr. Wells uh, went to Ireland and would uh, pay the, the passage for people. It was a $5 a person, I think, at that time, um, and recruited people to come and, and dig the canal. Again, the pilots were responsible for bringing those people here. I mean, it, 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 and when you listen to those, those figures of our population, a lot of people came to Bradford County over a short period of time. Pilot, in his capacity as superintendent of the canal and builder of several sections of the canal, came in close contact with these Irish immigrants. He saw to it as soon as possible they were naturalized and became boaters. For many years, they looked to him for guidance. He was quick to offer his assistance in order to further the interests of the Democratic Party and its candidates. Part of Pilate's political strength in northeastern Pennsylvania rested on his Irish vote. Well, <clears throat> that didn't last too long. The, um, the, uh, the Irish got upset with Mr. Pilate because they didn't think that he was um, representing them fairly. And um, the, the Irish in Ridgebury, uh, they got angry with him and they sent a letter. Um, it's, it's pretty colorful. I, I won't read it to you, but it's full of uh, dams to hell for Mr. Pilot, and he eventually lost their support. But um, we're, we're, we're kind of glad to have this, and we understand that there's a safe deposit box around that has a couple other letters in it, so we're going to try to get our hands on some of those. <clears throat> This picture, too, came from the, the box from Massachusetts. This is Joseph E. Pilot, who was Victor's brother. He was born in Wysock, August 30th, 1819. Joseph spent his entire life in partnership with his brother Victor in extensive farming, railroading, and canal building. They constructed many miles of the Lehigh Valley Railroad and almost the entire roadbed of the Barclay Railroad and was known as a practical and scientific farmer. For 11 years, he was president of the Bradford County Agriculture Society. Joseph married Esther Cox in Dauphin County in 1849. They were the parents of five children, John, Joseph, Matilda, Victor, and Easter. Joseph Pilot died on July 16, 1994. His wife followed him to the grave on August 12, 1894. This is the Bull Survey of 1888, and it shows the land holdings of the Pilots in the area of Wysock. You see the mansion, Joseph's house, the Pilot store, Note the barns are across Route 6. These barns burned in a spectacular fire July 27, 1891. The barn was 150 feet by 60 and had wings extending 300 feet. The survey shows 681 acres for the pilot property. Everything outlined in green was part of the farm. I guess you can kind of see that. So, 
This was Joseph Pilate's home in Wysock, which everybody knows as the, the motel that was over there for years. And this is Bonneville, as it orig was originally named. Louis Pilate wrote this description for his granddaughter, Sarah Pilate, while she was a student at Penn State in 1941. In the spring of 1870, Victor E. Pilate selected a spot in back of our old house on the same lot and started operations. He was his own architect, laid out the cellar, and had it dug and hired local stone masons to build the walls. The stone came from York Quarries, about a mile from the lot. The walls were two feet thick and laid lumber under each room according to size and dimension, eight feet high. The joists were plastered close together and thoroughly braced. Between them, three inches from the top was a floor with three inches of mortar to deaden the sound and on top of that, the floor. There were not many bricklayers here, so he got men from Philadelphia to come and work on the house. Some of them made their home in Tawanda. All the brick inside was burned on the farm. The outside walls were a brick from Horseheads, New York, a harder brick. The outside walls were 16 inches thick, one brick on the outside with a four-inch space for air circulation tied to the eight-inch inner wall bricks every course. The partition walls went to the attic. The outside walls a little higher. The plasters came from Philadelphia. Their names were Hoffman, and they went to Tawanda to live, and there's still Hoffmans here today. One's a doctor. The windows and doors were all arches, and casings had to be fitted. Mr. Henry Gable, a cabinet maker, made all of the window and door frames from choice white pine lumber that was saved by your great-grandfather from a sawmill he owned for a number of years. Also, black walnut, maple, cherry, oak, and chestnut, all with the intention to be used in his house when he built it. The carpenters were all local men, Jim Kinsman, Bill Green, George Ruddy, Bill Dimmick, Charles Dimmick, and Fred Schultz. Your great-grandmother used to say that he started with the library and skylight and built the rest of the house around it. The four gables all branch out from the skylight. The library is an oak and chestnut with bookcases on two floors. The floors in the library and halls are a black walnut and maple laid in tile. There are double staircases in the hall made of oak. The parlor is a black walnut and the bedroom's the same. The dining room chestnut and oak and the front room done in cherry. It takes 100 yards of carpet to cover the living room floor. The casings for the window and door frames were all sawed out by hand and were put in place by screws, countersunk and plugged. The house was frescoed by people from Philadelphia. A slate roof by men from Hazleton. The house was all piped for gas when built. There was a big storage tank for water which was piped into the kitchen and bathrooms. The kitchen was off the dining room and the back of that was a washroom with a big fireplace and drain. The cellar was paved and grouted. All the floors except the library and halls were of one and one quarter inch yellow pine. The stone on the porch is 10 foot square and the stone steps came from a quarry and a shopping. Your great grandfather conceived the idea of inside blinds for all the windows in his first and second story of the house. He had a plan with trolley tracks built in the walls over the windows when the bricks were laid. The blinds had wheels to go on the tracks and shove back into the brick walls when open. The ceilings on the first floor are 13 feet and on the second floor 12 feet. There are six fireplaces downstairs and two upstairs. He hired an architect named Fleming to help design and build the cupola. The house was filled with a mass of overstuffed furniture, ottomans, marble top tables, carved sideboards, and canopied beds. The walls, in addition to the massive mirrors imported from France, were covered with gilt-framed paintings and chromes, pettit point mottos, fresh saw racks, and scroll work brackets. The remaining space was garnished with potted plants, plaster groups, bronze statues, wax flowers, shells, beadwork, and other brick brack on multiple tiered whatnots. It is said that it took a ton of coal or a cord of wood daily to heat the massive house. The Braffer reporter stated on December 4, 1873, Colonel Pilot has at last moved into his elegant mansion at Wasocking. He has been several years in building it, and we are informed that it is a model dwelling. This is a, a drawing of the asylum map, of which was supposed to be the courthouse. There it is thought that Victor Pilate may have modeled his design for his home. The cupola before it was completely destroyed. And this is a train from the Barclay Railroad constructed by the Pilate brothers. 
Another photo of Victor Emile Pilate. And this is a news article. The Pilot brothers at their sawmill on Barkley Mountain, May 22, 1873, Colonel Pilot met with an accident a few days since, which might have proven very serious. In company with his brother and another gentleman, he was proceeding in a spring wagon to his mill at Carbon Creek, Carbon Run, when an axle tree broke, precipitating the whole party to the ground and throwing the colonel down an embankment about 25 feet. Fortunately, however, he escaped without much harm, but it is as a wonder that he was not badly, badly injured. This is Victor Pilate's only daughter, Emily Victorine Pilate. She married Robert Packer in the new Pilate home on September 2, 1875. And this is Robert A. Bob Packer. Bob Packer, well, we, we just hear Robert Packer, Robert Packer, he was Bob. The Elmira Advertiser covered the wedding in the following is some of the write-up. The wedding ceremony of yesterday was a beautiful one. In the library, under the strong light of the cupola, stood on one side Colonel Pilate and his wife, the father and mother of the bride. On the other, Honorable and Mrs. Aza Packer, father and mother of the groom. About forming a circle were the relatives, many deep, while on the balconies of the two stories above were other friends and guests. At one o'clock, the hour appointed, Mrs. Nellie M. Collins, Collins, Fanny P. Skeer, Sally Weirman, and Lizzie H. Kubal entered by way of the front hall. They were speedily followed by the bride and groom, arm in arm. The bride was most beautifully dressed. The article, which was long, further stated that the presents were plentiful and beautiful. The groom was by no means forgotten here either. One of his gifts attracting much attention was a complete hunting and fishing outfit. To be sure, the gum was one that had been used in Queen Anne's time, and the fish hooks might have served at some time in their lives as anchors to a good-sized yacht. So. Oh. That is Bob and Emily Packer's home in Sarah, which was finished in 1877. The dining room ceiling was of hand-carved Moroccan leather and cost $50,000 when installed. Bob Packer died in 1883. Afterwards, Emily married Robert Eggleston, cashier of the Lincoln National Bank of New York City. On January 9, 1885, Governor Robert E. Patterson appointed Victor E. Pilette to be a member of the State Board of Agriculture. As stated previously, Victor was very interested in agriculture and was a champion for the farmer and very involved in the Grange. In 1875, he delivered an address before the Bradford County Agricultural Society on the fairgrounds. The people looked forward to an interesting and practical address. The old Bradford County farmer, as the colonel was called, from long experience, was fully capable of the theme assigned him. Victor E. Pilot died August 27, 1890 in Wysock. He was, in many respects, the most naturally gifted man ever born in Bradford County, a typical American in every sense. He left his impress upon the county where he was born and the state in which he passed a long, active, and useful business life. And truly, he was. This is Louis Eugene Pilate. He was born at Wysock, May 22, 1859. His childhood was surrounded with the unusual advantages that come of great wealth. After completing his education, his parents sent him to travel both in this country and Europe. His companionship in his travels was most fortunately part of the time with Robert Packer, with whom he visited most of the noted spots in Europe, many parts of this country and in the old world. When he returned home, he began at once to relieve his father of some of the vast business cares. At the same time, he was not allowing his literary taste to rust or spoil, and he gave careful attention to the great economic questions of government. As a young as young as he was in 1890, he canvassed the entire state on behalf of the grand old Republican Party, winning laurels where often older veterans of the stump had failed to catch the public favor. In 1896, he was a member of the state legislature, and throughout his life, he was always greatly in demand as a public speaker. On November 29, 1885, Lewis married Georgiana Mowry, daughter of Honor Ezekiel Mowry of Wyoming County, and together they lived a very full life, taking part in all activities for community betterment, especially the Robert Packer Hospital. He was the oldest member of the RPH board in a point of service, having been a member for 43 years and president of the board for 21. They entered the, the Wasaki Grange and rose high, not only in local, but state circles.
Lewis and Georgiana had three children, Victor Emil, Thomas Weirman, and Emily Spear. Vic and Tom Pilot, sons of Lewis and Georgiana. And this is a group of ladies gathered on the porch of the Joseph E. Pilot home in Wysock, and a few of them are identified on the picture. And this is the dedication of the new Guthrie Clinic building at the Robert Packer Hospital campus in 1928. Seated is Charles D. Marvin. Charles Marvin was from Owego, and he um, donated almost all the money to build the School of Nursing Residents. Next to him is Dr. Charles H. Mayo of the Mayo Clinic. Next to him is E.E. E. Loomis, president of the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Next to him is H.A. Gibbons of Princeton University. Standing is Louis Pilot, president of the RPH board. Then Bishop Starr of the Episcopal Diocese. Dr. Donald Guthrie. I'd like to point out how short Dr. Guthrie was. I don't think he'll realize what little guy he was. Next to him is Rodney Merker and Reverend P.T. Kelly of the Diocese of Scranton, and A.I. Decker. And I believe A.I. Decker was a big lumberman from Tawanda that lived in a big brick house up on 3rd Street with a tower on it. September 30th, 1935, Honorable Louis E. Pilette was elected president of the Bradford County Historical Society. We had to get that in there. <laughs> Louis E. Pilette died April 10th, 1941. His wife preceded him February 4th, 1939. As their health failed, they left the farm and moved to a residence on York Avenue in Tawanda. Thomas Weirman Pilot was the last of the pilot men to live in the mansion. Tom was born June 5th, 1888 and spent most of his life in the vicinity of Wysock. He graduated from Tawanda High School where he made a name for himself in athletics and then entered Cornell University. While in Ithaca, he rode with the varsity crew. Transferring to Penn State, Tom played superb football, his position being an end. In his senior year, he was mentioned by the late Walter Camp as being All-American caliber. Numerous people saw him play prior to his graduation in 1911. Upon his return to this locality, he took a keen interest in high school football and often gave much of his time to aid in coaching. He was also a fine basketball player. Mr. Pilette was one was in the lumber and contracted business for a number of years before ill health made it imperative that he retire. He was associated with James Ayers and the Tawanda Lumber Company, the two building numerous schoolhouses throughout the northern part of the state. Tom Pilet married Cynthia Osborne December 29, 1920 at her parents' home in Tawanda. Tom and Cynthia had four daughters, Sally, Joan, Joyce, and Cynthia. And Cynthia is here tonight in the front row. After Tom Pilot's death in July 20th, 1939, at a sanitarium at Castle Point, New York, Louis Pilot, old and in poor health, himself sold the Pilot holdings to Dr. Isaac Stoll, who ran the farm but did not use the house, and this began a long period of decline for the majestic castle in the heart of Bradford County. This is a young Tom Pilot. This is Joan, Sally, Cynthia, and Joyce, circa 1930. And this is Mary Jones, as told by Mary Jones to Wes Skillings in 2014. One day their mailman from Loraysville, Ed Osborne, stopped and asked Mary's mother if she might be interested in working as a housekeeper for his daughter at their home in Wysock. That home turned out to be the impressive Pilot Mansion. This would have been the summer of 1933, and the 13-year-old farm girl would find herself with immense responsibility, cooking, cleaning, and watching two young girls who lived there. There was a lot of traffic on the road in front of the mansion, but the attraction was at the top of the Pond Hill in one of the area's biggest tourist attractions, Lake Wasocking. She remembers the spacious residence and a pair of staircases ascending several floors with a cupola on high. There was a grand piano under one, a piano never, she never saw anyone play. At the foot of the other, you could see all the way to the top, which seemed a fantastic height for a young girl from a humble farm. There was a large library on the second floor with book-laden shelves all around, and much of the mansion was off limits. She still remembers the mysterious white door in the basement that was taboo. She lived there all week, though not as an equal by any means. The stairs she most often used were in the back. She ate meals in her own nook away from the family table after helping preparing the meals. The father, Tom, had TB, and you never saw him. At mealtime, he would make his own food and use his own pots and dishes. That was about the only time you saw him, and he stayed pretty much in his own quarters. Mary's most impressive memory was a massive interior hallway, so big they had a regulation slide like the ones you see on playgrounds for the girls to play on. Did you ever play on that slide? 
This, this I thought was fascinating. The Pilot Sacconi Station, owned by Tom and Vic. This was the forerunner of Fulmer's gas station. It was erected by Tom and Vic sometime between 1932 and 1936. Six. Vic lived on the West Coast, returning to Wysock in 1932. There is a connection here to the Robert Packer Hospital, as Emily Baker Guthrie, who was Donald Guthrie's wife, her uncle, and her guardian during her childhood was Herbert Baker, the president of Sacconi, Standard Oil Company of New York. You can be sure there was a connection made with Baker for Tom and Vic, who were both in poor health at the time. Sacconi became mobile, which, the, which is what the Fulmer gas station carried. And these are images of the house throughout the years. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> that was a good thing. And that's kind of as, as things started to deteriorate, but you get a, 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 a picture of what the stairway looked like and you can see that there, there's all kinds of frescoing on the ceiling. The Wyalusing Rocket did a feature story on the mansion in 1958. Dave Keeler was kind enough to share the photos from that story with us. Pictured here is 10-year-old Dave Keeler at the pilot piano. So, I wonder why nobody played it. <laughs> the Grand Hall. And this was the kitchen, and um, this is from the Saturday Evening Times, but I remember the hole in that kitchen when we used to go on little tours through the place because that was scary that somebody might fall in there. That's Dave Keeler sitting in a mass of books thrown down from the balcony into the rotunda floor. The cupola as it deteriorated. A mobile home parked on the front lawn. Fulmer's mobile station in 1965. And then this was the big fire in 1970 when Fulmer's gas station burned down. And that's Sam Fulmer in the Grand Hall of the Pilot Mansion. He purchased the home and land in 1968. And this is also from the Sarah Evening Times that, that shows the roof where it was full of holes when the uh, Fulmers purchased the house. And this is when it became Fulmer Shopping Center. And then on March 31st, 1978, the cupola was removed. From 1985 to 2011, the complex was called the Wysock General Store. It was owned by Richard and Kathy Bice. In 2011, Dandy Minimarts purchased the pilot property and began a multi-year project to repair and preserve the outside of the building and remodel the interior. Part of this plan was to replace the Long Gong Cupola. The Cupola returned in 2014. That, that's the mansion as it appears today from the highway. And then this is descendants of the pilot family that visited the Bradford County Museum, and this must have been about 2019. Very good. And there's more of the family. Most of those people are here tonight. And this was the end of our presentation. We thank Dandy Minimarts and the Williams family for saving and preserving one of our most valuable historic treasures. Bradford County has something to be proud of in Wysock. And thank you, pilots. Any questions? Because I'm sure the pilots would love to answer them. <laughs> yes? 
No, it wasn't built at the time of the Underground Railroad. That was built in the 1870s. So the, the story that I understand is that they had a general store across the street that's still on the corner. Uh, for years and years, it was an office supply place, and there was a tunnel that went from there to the river. So if there was any place that was a stop, it would have been there. Yes. It rotted and fell apart. Also, that wasn't the original one. That they put back up? No, it's a new one. No, I think it, I think it was made by some of the shores. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and they, you know, he's written all the time as a champion of the farmer, and he truly was, so. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Oh, you got a question? They bought it. They got it, you know, the, the grants. Uh, the, the Pennsylvania had uh, Connecticut land grants, they had Penn, William Penn land grants, and you know people that had money were buying up everything they could. But it was this Luray de Chamas that, that was buying all this land up. Um, my people came, the pilot sponsored my family in 1836. They came from Ireland and they came to Bradford County and when we were cleaning out farmhouses up on the, the Lake Hill, the, the old farms, we found the original deeds in the Luray de Chamas. You know, they, they came right um, from his stuff, but he just bought vast areas of land. And now, uh, you know, Charles Carroll was another person, all of Ridgebury and all those places, he bought all that land, and then he sold it out in parcels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I forgot to bring my water out. I thought it was going to die at one point. <laughs> so come back next month. Thank you, Henry. Come back next month for the program Out of the Woods from Deerfield to the Grand Circuit, which is a book written by Ellen Williams and involves Bradford County. So we'll see you next month on the third Friday of the month at August 20th. Thank you.